lungs. Talk about your feelings. And as long as, it, long as my feelings don't run out of battery. It comes with a proprietary charger. <laughs> Let's do a show. Here we go. At the end of the day, making free content doesn't come cheap. Show your support for the independent content you're listening to right now at patreon.com slash acedetect. That's patreon.com forward slash A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 18th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me, as he does many times on a Thursday and many other days, Justin Robert Young of Weird Things, Jury Talks, Night Attack, and DTNS. Yeah. Man, uh, I'm, 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 so, uh, I'm so excited to be back on the show, sliding back in to your tech news uh, podcasting lives, listeners. Like the Cardinals into the Astros. <laughs> as soon as you started that metaphor, I knew where it was going to end up. Uh, where are you coming from today? My uh, Morristown, New Jersey. Morristown. Oh. What's Morristown known for? Uh, the hotel that I'm in right now. <laughs> the I have famous no hotel that Justin Robert Young stayed in. Uh, yeah, I know. Morristown, you know, it's known for being a 30-minute trip from Newark International Airport. All right. Well, let's take a look at the headlines. Mark Gurman over at 9to5Mac, who, by the way, every time I say his name, I'm like, who's really got a good record with, with the rumors? But he does. As, a, as tiring as it is that he's right so often, uh, has some sources who say Apple's plan for Apple Watch 2 includes adding a video camera with FaceTime functionality, a new wireless system for greater iPhone independence, so you can do more things on the watch without being tethered to the phone, new ways to be more expensive, also known as premium options between the $1,000 and $10,000 levels, and battery life uh, expected to be not different, the same as the current Apple Watch. Apple will likely release a full next-generation Apple Watch next year. That's when we expect them usually to do things yearly. But that camera might or might not make it into next year's edition. might be pushed off to a future one. Which, of course, if the battery life is the same and they have things like a front-facing camera and a Wi-Fi radio on there, that would mean that there is more battery capacity. It would just be our experience would be that the battery life is about the same, which I think that was probably the most overblown of fears for the watch uh, compared to, I think, how the, uh, things have shaken out. There really Some people been... are complaining about it. Legitimately can't get through a day without recharging it. Uh, but it's not as bad, I think, as people... Work. Yeah, I, I, you're really working on that watch if 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 you can't get through uh if you can't get through a day with it in my opinion. But uh, you know, I, the big question for this is where do you think Apple wants the watch to be released? Because they have very much chafed at uh, they tried they have moved successfully the iPhone release you know to the spring where in the year. I get it. Okay. Yeah, where in the year? Where in the season? Do they see the watch? Because I do think they probably want it. Oh, do they want to give it its own little release window? Do they want to release it when they release the new phones in the fall or the iPads in the spring? Uh, I think that'll be a, a good uh, question. You know, as iPad becomes more and more a commodity, very much like the iPod Touch, maybe uh, we start seeing the watch being the flagship of the fall announcement. That would make sense. You would. BuzzFeed's Matt Honan got a sneak peek at a Twitter project called Lightning that is targeted to launch later this year. Project Lightning brings photos, videos, and tweets together in an in an in if hard right, easy for me to say in an event-based curate, uh, curated view that's embeddable across the web. So anything from breaking news to sporting events to award shows can be viewed whether you're logged in or not. If you are logged in, you can view them in a separate section or follow an event that uh, and see it blended into your regular timeline. Twitter expects to have 7 to 10 events running on any given day. It's the uh, last hurrah of Dick Costolo, who apparently did this interview with Matt Honan two days before he announced he was leaving as a CEO of Twitter. And it's his sop to people who complain that Twitter doesn't have enough active users He's been beating the drum to say, hey, Twitter really doesn't need active users as much as it needs viewers, as it needs readers of the active users it does have. And this is an attempt to 
take advantage of that. And I think it's a really interesting capitalization on something people use Twitter for regularly, which is following live events. Uh, certainly so. It also takes advantage of the fact that when Twitter put in embeddable tweets, it really uh, made a difference in terms of web reporting of uh, people not just copying and pasting text, which is really all you want to see and putting quotes around it into their story, but putting the full, rich, Twitter-enabled uh, embed right there. So uh, as a way to capitalize on the fact that people are already using that function. I think this makes sense. However... You do have to wonder whether or not the rabbi, uh, Dick Costolo, <laughs> whose baby this apparently was, uh, will uh, affect how it is deployed now that he no longer has the top position. Honan did get a quote from Jack Dorsey who said, I'm 100% behind this project. So at least out of the gate, the interim CEO isn't showing any signs well, of Well, sure. But if he hated it, what is he going to say? <laughs> this is I terrible and I'm like, 100% I'm behind fired. this project. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we actually have three stories about uh, new ways to get news. The next web reports BuzzFeed itself has a news app of its own available for iOS today. BuzzFeed News is the name of the app. Shows you the most important real news of the day. Not listicles, not that kind of BuzzFeed, but the real honest to God reporting like what Matt Honan did. Uh, plus breakdowns by topic. You can even opt in and push notifications uh, either from things like major breaking news or specific categories like politics. And you can also opt in to specific story alerts. So right now, for instance, you can say, show me all the stories of the FIFA corruption investigation. Let me know anytime a new one breaks. Perfect time for them to roll this out. Probably the biggest impact they have in terms of original reporting is in politics. And with the political season coming up, this is a great time for them to flex their muscle. Yeah, presidential election topic. Have that thing uh, you know, let you know anytime there's a breaking news story about it. And and folks who don't know, there are two BuzzFeeds. There are many BuzzFeeds, I'm sure. But there is the BuzzFeed you all joke about with its clickbait headlines. And then there's a real hardworking, journalistic integrity version of BuzzFeed that does excellent original reporting. Yes, there's, there's, the buzz, there, there's the BuzzFeed that is paying good reporters that no longer work at newspapers because newspapers don't pay anybody anymore. But wait! There's more to this news podcast for which covers how news is covered. Fortune reports on Google News Lab's three new crowdsourced journalism projects. YouTube Newswire is getting the most headlines. It's a video platform collaboration with Storyful that features verified YouTube videos that news outlets can use to embed or use or embed. Another project called First Draft Coalition will train folks in verification and ethics. He sighed. Uh, and the Witness Media Lab is a Google partnership with nonprofit Witness that trains non-journalists in reporting injustice and human rights violations worldwide. Now, why are you sighing about the uh, ethics and verification training? Uh, it, uh, noble. It's a noble idea. I, <laughs> well, I think the idea is good, which is existing journalists who didn't, uh, you know, cut their chops on the Internet uh, could benefit from a, a little training about like what is believable on the Internet and what isn't. No, I, it is a problem. I don't know if this is the solution, which is, I guess, why I gave it a snotty, dismissive reaction. But uh, I'm, I'm. Can I, I guess, jump in here for a second? Yeah, Jenny. absolutely. Sure. Jenny. Oh, a wild Jenny! I actually worked with Storyful when I worked at Yahoo, and I did find them to be as advertised, which is to say, as a as a in an organization where you don't have a fully built out news staff the way you did at a traditional newspaper or a magazine or wherever, having them take that verification of a YouTube video function away is a huge time saver. And there was there was never a time in the time that we used them that they biffed it. Um, there was, and they were, you know, so it was just one of those things where it's actually a super valuable function because the art of chasing one person's YouTube video in Russia is like in the immortal words of, ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, yeah. So anyway, my two cents. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think, I think that that is a great uh, idea. And that to me makes a lot more sense because it's an actual product and, and, and a tool that people can use. Uh, the other uh, ones, I'm, I'm just kind of curious as to know what their target 
audiences because I feel that a lot of the, uh, you know, and, and we call it citizen journalists or amateur journalists if you want to be a jerk about it, uh, don't really consider themselves journalists. Like they are doing what we would consider to be no news gathering, but I think they think of themselves more as private citizens who are just getting the news out. So I, I don't know if they're, if they will be wooed to hear lessons about verification and, and stuff like that beyond the idea of, hey, if you put this out, maybe there's you know a little uh, clippy that pops up in the corner of your screen that says, hey, it looks like you might get sued for publishing that. <laughs> you know, could, would you like to take a lesson on journalism? I see you're trying to commit libel. Would you like some <laughs> help with that? Uh, you know, I think it's better to have these than not, frankly, because people are definitely not going to get trained if they don't have the resources for it. But Honestly, when I look at all three of these stories here, I see the outline of where news is going. When you hear about the death of journalism, you are t hearing about the death of a business model, not yes. the death of journalism. And I think these three stories show that we have lots of momentum towards journalism and a lot of interest in journalism, whether it's listicles providing the funding for original reporting, uh, whether it's a, a YouTube newswire taking advantage of crowdsourced uh, video to provide things, as Jenny said, that would have taken a lot more time and effort to gather, or Twitter uh, essentially creating you know, the biggest staffed live reporting outfit that has ever existed in history. I mean, none of these are the silver bullet, but they are the outline of the future of journalism. Uh, and and one, one last thing on this. So this is a golden age of journalism, and anybody who says different is flatly wrong. Uh, the biggest criticism that anybody would have about the modern era is that, A, anybody can do it, and B, that lies can make their way to public consciousness quicker than they have in the past, which objectively is true. What is untrue or misleading about that statement is to think that a lies did not constantly make their way to the public consciousness before when we had fewer gatekeepers and what is absolutely inarguable is that lies can be corrected at a speed for which they never could be before when even corrections would get buried in some you know languish languishing element of uh, you know the back of the a section so i think th th these are all great tools uh, when I when I, I, I sniffed at that uh, the, the the verification stuff, it is not to say that we are not in a beautiful time for journalism. It is just to say I hope that in this awkward teenage years uh, of this new model, that we can continue to hone what is best to get the most accurate information. Yeah. And and the other thing, the other element that you, the only other element you didn't touch on, as far as I'm concerned, is funding. And that's that's just a matter of trying things until we figure out which one works. It's not that people won't pay. It's figuring out how to make it so that they put their money where it has the best effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I believe that will happen. I'm a Pollyanna about it. So there. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, and WebKit project engineers have announced they're teaming up together. Yeah, all of those folks together. See, who's the Pollyanna now? WebAssembly, it's a byte code for the web, according to TechCrunch. The new format lets programmers compile code for the browser. They're currently focused on C, C++, but they're gonna add more later where it is then executed inside the JavaScript engine without having to parse the full code. That speeds up execution. Hope is that WebAssembly will provide developers with a single compilation target for the web that will become a standard that's implemented in all browsers. The team also plans a script that will convert WebAssembly to ASM.js so that it can run in any browser at all, even if it doesn't support WebAssembly. And they hope to add support for more languages and new tools over time. And TechCrunch reports on the EFF's fifth annual privacy report that rates online service providers' commitment to transparency and privacy. The report rewards up to five stars in categories like best practices, data retention, government data demands, government data removal demands, and pro-user uh, public policy, specifically opposing backdoors and digital services. 21 of the 24 companies evaluated meant met this last criteria, nine companies got five stars, including Adobe, Apple, uh, what, what, is, what is the pronunciation on this? Fredo. I mean, Credo. Credo, I mean, Credo. Right? I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Uh, uh, Credo shot first. Uh, Dropbox, Sonic, Wicker, Wikimedia, WordPress.com, Yahoo, AT&T, and WhatsApp received one star. 
Uh, so AT and T and WhatsApp received one star. Just to be clear, Yahoo yeah. received five stars. Yahoo received five stars. AT and T and WhatsApp one star for you. One star for you. And Verizon got called out, even though they had two stars for just being particularly poor in even the stars that they got according to the EFF. Uh, but one thing that was positive about this report is they said, across the board, all companies have improved uh, in light of the last couple of years of revelation. So we are seeing more commitment to transparency and privacy than ever before. So they had to actually uh, up their requirements for you to get a star this time. Well, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's good when somebody like the EFF is uh, a poking their nose into uh, these kind of uh, th these kind of situations, and b are certainly uh, you know maybe seeing progress and seeing uh, that the big players in the industry are actually doing what they say. Captain Kipper is one of the folks who submits regularly on the subreddit, and you can be too. Go to dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let us know what stories you'd like us to cover. In fact, you can be lazy about it if you're like that. Sounds like a lot of work, Tom. You don't have to submit anything. You can just go and look at all the stuff that other people have submitted and play judge. Set yourself up as judge and jury for what stories we should cover at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Captain Kipper sent us the Verge story that as of June 29th, Reddit itself will be serving all of its pages over SSL. The site already supports connections over SSL, but the new system will automatically direct all connections to the SSL-protected version of the site. Encrypt all the things. Reddit is now on board. Finally, my uh, the fact of that I spend most of my day on R squared circle will be encrypted from prying eyes. Star Fury Zeta alerted us to this Ars Technica story that Sprint has stopped throttling its heaviest data users, even when its network is congested to avoid potential violations of the Federal Communication Commission's new net neutrality rules. Quote, for less than a year, Sprint used a network management practice that applied only at the level of individual congested cell sites and only for as long as congestion existed. Upon review, and to ensure that our practices are consistent with the FCC's new net neutrality rules, we determined that the network's management technique was not needed, end quote, from Sprint itself. Yeah, uh, they didn't say new. I noticed you kind of just uh, naturally put that in there, and uh, I think they didn't say new in their quote on purpose, the only reason I pointed out is these are the 2010 rules, not the 2015 rules. And gotcha. these are the rules that AT&T uh, got slapped a $100 million uh, potential fine uh, accusation yesterday. This is Sprint saying, oh, that program we started a year ago? Yeah, that's the one, very similar to the one that AT&T just got in trouble for. Let's yank that right now. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the, the newly implemented rules, but it is a chilling effect of the enforcement against AT&T. Because Sprint said, we don't think they actually violated those transparency rules, but just to be safe, we're ending the program. Uh, do you think that this is like a, a, a legitimate beginning uh, of the end of, of throttling for unlimited plans? It's possible. I mean, we'll see in 29 days when the FCC finally decides whether to uh, extend that fine to AT&T or not. It's, you know, a lot of people were, were pointing out that $100 million is not that much to a company as large as AT&T. It's not exactly so much the fine as the, the public nature of it uh, and, 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 you know, violating the regulation. It's it just no company really wants to get entangled in that if they don't have to. It's too late for AT&T. But yeah, uh, obviously it made SoftBank and Sprint think twice about keeping that plan in place. Well, the other thing about that is that, yeah, 100 million will be whatever it is to AT&T's coffers, but nobody wants, that is a big enough number to say you don't want it again, and you certainly don't want to be caught on further offenses for which you can say you didn't learn your lesson, and now we have to find you more than 100 million dollars. Yeah, it's like the $80 uh, parking fine, right? To a lot of people, $80 is, you know, it's really not that much. Uh, but no, nobody wants to get fined. Nobody wants to get ticketed, and at and kind of the same way. Yeah. And that's the end of everything in the headlines. All right, we got a couple of stories uh, today that were floating around up there that made us think that we need to talk to you about our feelings. Uh, mm. 
They are, they're both emotion-tugging robot stories. One of them is SoftBank, the previously mentioned SoftBank, uh, getting in bed with Alibaba and Foxconn to make and sell the humanoid robot Pepper. It goes on sale this weekend in Japan, actually, and Pepper is being used in SoftBank's stores already as sort of a greeter. Uh, Pepper's very humanoid has articulated five-finger hands, uh, you know, laughs and jokes and speaks in four or five languages, uh, doesn't have articulated legs, but can move around, you know, on a flat surface. And the idea is to get these in people's homes as sort of emotional companions. So it's not a functional robot. It's not going to do things for you, but it can talk, it can listen, and, and more importantly, it learns about you. Uh, it has a, a, a learning algorithm that starts to learn your taste and, and what you like to talk about and things like that. Uh, it can actually translate what state you are in using its knowledge of emotions uh, and doing some facial expression analysis. And this comes at the same time that the New York Times did a follow-up on Ibo, the, uh, the robot dog circa 1999, from Sony. Sony stopped repairing IBOs in March of last year, 2014. They ended production of IBOs in 2006, but the video from the New York Times, which by the way is a fantastically produced uh, piece, just shows the emotional connection that people still have with these, you know, admittedly somewhat limited robots. So what, what, what is the deal here? Like, I thought we wanted robots to do our work for us, uh, Justin, but it sounds like we just, we just want someone to talk to. Well, we want technology to be our friend, or, or we want technology to continue to fill in what we add up to equal friendship. And this is, you know, we, we were entering into this story because these products are very specifically supposed to trigger emotional elements uh, in your life, and, and that is their function, but it's not limited to them. Siri, you know, initially got uh, got attention because people like to tell jokes to it, and they then you know Apple made a point to advertise it as Siri will call you what you want it to call you. You know, there is a element of playfulness to what is an otherwise cold technology. Beyond Microsoft that, certainly trying to take advantage of that marketing Cortana with its personality. And even beyond that, uh, Pandora first very much came to prominence because of the idea of the musical genome project and that we could, through algorithms, learn your musical taste. And now you could have the friend that always turns you on to new music without, in fact, having a friend who turns you on to new music. What is fascinating is where we are naturally rewarding technological advancements and where the leaders of the day continue to fill in for what we may or may not realize are emotional chasms that we want activated. Well, and we have been doing this to inanimate objects forever, probably. I don't know how long humans have been naming inanimate objects Uh, giving them genders, giving them personalities. Cars are a great example of that. People often name their cars and and talk about their personalities. Uh, And and so it's a perfectly natural extension of that, right? Uh, I get worried, not worried, worried is the wrong word, but I I wonder what the effect of fanboyism is and, and I know fanboyism is sort of a loaded term, but but that idea of your identity being tied up in a brand, right? So Android forever, no Apple forever, no you know Microsoft forever. Uh, if you now have the product, not just a somewhat inanimate object, or even able to like jump through some hoops and give some tricks like it has a personality, but genuinely programmed to give you emotion. And the Ibo story really highlights that because here are people. This this robot hasn't been made in nine years the parts are now impossible to to get from the company so you have to like cannibalize other ibos essentially and yet they show this uh elderly couple in japan just they've got like a dozen of these things they keep them going they take them on trips they take pictures with them uh so we are now going to be even more invested in whatever brand or product we decide to bring into our lives well, yeah, and also it's we are at a gateway to, I think you know, we we will look at the IBO as 
you know, in, in the same way that we look at balancing your humors as as medicine, like it, it is incredibly primitive uh, compared to where we're going. I mean, the idea of a barely functioning AI, like we see with Cortana and Alexa and Siri, uh, you know, compared to where we will have you know, uh, when, when these things have memories and these things remember that, you know, uh, maybe calling my uh, ex-girlfriend after I asked for uh, directions to the bar is a bad idea. And it, it asks me whether or not I really want to do it, you know, uh, whether or not it calls an Uber for me before I drive home. Apparently, all of my examples involve getting drunk in bars, but uh, <laughs> uh, which shows you exactly my need for friends. Uh, <laughs> These are are intensely personal things, and we are seeing it now with wearables and very specifically the Apple Watch. I mean, the Apple Watch, to me, is the first, uh, and for whatever you might think of it as a product, uh, it is designed to be inwardly facing as opposed to outwardly facing, uh, which very much watches had been in the past. It's the only Siri interface that Apple has that doesn't naturally speak back to you. You speak to it, and it gives you, uh, you know, other ways to tell you that it has received your message. Uh, the Taptic Engine is very much supposed to be a stealth, your relationship with the watch, uh, and then beyond that, you know, you can share the share it with the world. Uh, it's it's uh, it, it's something that even in the reviews, you can very much see if you do not get if you do not hit it off with what is an emotional product. People don't like it, and it's not like that gets better with time. I, I think people, uh, you know, find resentment in, in in certain elements of it in a way that uh, I think will will be a hallmark of the wearable, uh, the the wearable genre, just because it is supposed to be kind of under your skin in a way that other products aren't, because it's always with you. Uh, this is incredibly fascinating to me and I'm really I'm very interested to see where we go and more specifically do how many friends do we want how many how much emotional stimulation do we really uh, do, uh, are we going to hit a balance point at yeah and and do we want external simulated companions or or is Siri the better example of the AI friend we want something that's actually kind of part of you and is much more internalized, like you said. Uh, Pepper is certainly not the first companion robot to be marketed. Uh, it is claimed to be the most advanced, at, um, and, and it is targeted directly at emotion detecting and emotion and support. So maybe it'll be different when these start to get into homes. But lots of other products have been out there. They have a great day the day they're launched. The local news comes down and does a package, and then they end up in the cupboards. Uh, at least according to the BBC. They they don't continue to get used because at some point people just get bored with them and realize there's a limit to what they can do. Now, maybe Pepper will surpass that limit, but I think it's not just the sophistication of the AI at play there. I think there's something to the idea that I know you're not a real friend. Uh, and, and so it doesn't matter how good you are at it, convincing me of that. Even if you were operated by a human, I might eventually just turn back towards other things that are more part of me rather than separate from me. But again, let's break down what a friend is because I think that's where technology is already... Is I already... would have to have experience with having them, but you, you go ahead. <laughs> I know. If you weren't the news hermit shut in in your, uh, in, in your domicile, uh, finding all the news for everybody at all times of the day, <laughs> then maybe you would have these quote-unquote friends. Uh, <laughs> but where technology can do it is what... Again, I don't think that we will ever replace friends. I don't think we will ever... And maybe, maybe we will. You know, maybe I'll be proved wrong. I don't think we'll ever look at our phone and say, "Oh man, remember that friend?" Like in the way that we do a, a human. But there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot, all the little pieces that add up to you know the, the that gets circled when you think of what a friend is. There, you know, technology is already filling in for that. You know, it, it already is there, and those. So those relationships that we form with technology, cold may they, uh, might they be, are certainly real, you know, and they are 
life changing, not in to say that your life is totally changed, but it does affect how you live your daily life. And, you know, the fact of the matter is uh, they can succeed or uh, depending on how good the technology is. Obviously, Sony decided that as much as a couple in the new and yeah. Pizza, uh, Alibaba and SoftBank and Foxconn are saying, we think there's a good bet that Pepper can overcome that and sell lots of these uh, worldwide. They're going to sell for 198,000 yen. That's about $1,600 US, 1,000 pounds UK. Uh, and you'll even be able to rent them. But they require a monthly service fee. So I'm not sure. And you have to sign a three-year three a three three year contract. Uh, mm. you know, so you start to get into, well, is this actually something I want to sign on to? But I think that points out to me the most exciting thing about both of these stories, especially the SoftBank one, is that we are now at the point where we are seriously and legitimately discussing, A, whether a uh, personality-based robot is worth buying and bringing into your home or not. Uh, that's a reality. That's a choice. That's a marketing choice, a yeah. consumer choice you have now. Just think on that for a moment. Uh, we were there That's with smartwatches maybe 15 years ago, uh, and, and we're, we're still not quite over the hump there. So it, it, it all depends. But that's a fascinating turn of events from my point of view. Uh, absolutely. And, and it'll be very, very interesting to see, uh, you know, where it, where, where, when the rubber meets the road. Because, again, uh, 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 the one thing that we can say universally about people's emotional uh, output is that it is not universal, right? Like, you know, everybody is different. Everybody handles things uh, in, in a way that you is, is a tremendously complex, uh, you know, algorithm to write. Like, for example, if I had Pepper in my house and it did the one thing that is my greatest pet peeve, which is, uh, alerting me to the fact that I am cranky when I am in fact cranky, I would have to take its head off. <laughs> and you can put it back on later. That's the nice thing about Pepper. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, they are making parts for that. Uh, yeah. And one assumes that the Pepper robot would then learn, oh, I get my head taken off. I know not to bring that up. Yeah. Or, Hopefully but, but then again, maybe it knows me better than I know myself. And when I am stressful, it feeds me things to bring me down to another level. Maybe it, it, it reminds me of my favorite song. Maybe it tells me that I should sit down and watch a TV show that I kind of want to see. Calls an Uber that set the destination for your favorite bar. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, it, it is, it'll be very, very interesting. And again, it doesn't have to be warm. It just has to be right. And it has mm -hmm. to be right at the right moment. We don't, I think when, whenever we think of AI or we think of emotional responses to technology, we kind of like all roads lead to her, like the movie, right? Yeah. Like we just think that it's going to be indistinguishable from having a human Scarlett companion. Johansson. Yeah. And, and Scarlett Johansson, as we might all wish. Uh, but I don't think that's right. I think that it will it will more likely be a very unique relationship that we have with this kind of stuff, but because it doesn't sleep and because it remembers more than an average human can remember, uh, it has the opportunity to just steer us maybe two degrees. The two degrees that we barely notice in every single day, that you're feeling upset and then somebody turns on your favorite song and you all of a sudden don't feel so upset anymore because you heard your favorite song in a car driving by what if that's an ability that we decide to surround ourselves with and it's not like oh man like i was talking to my buddy computer joe the other day and he had the best one-liner uh instead it's just i'm happier when i have this on yeah it just that's it, powerful that's and that's a harder thing to catch on because it's not as obvious in the first week of use right it's something you have to you have to live with a piece of technology for a while for that to, to catch on. But once it does, man, that has some staying power, the way you're describing it, for sure. Uh, hey, you know, I got together with a bunch of folks in Seattle uh, when I was up there, and I'm pretty sure most of them were not robots. They were awesome people. They were very warm and friendly, and it was great. And at one of them, a guy asked about being able to rip uh, his non-protected DVDs and Blu-rays so that his wife could have access to the files on her iPhone 6 
And Sarah in sunny Seattle, who was there, couldn't remember the name of one of the programs to let him know he could do this. She has remembered. If you're listening, sir, try Walter by Softerino. It's W-A-L-T-R uh, in the old-fashioned way, no E at the very end. Uh, according to their website, it takes the suck out of copying music and video into your iPhone or iPad. Drag and drop MKV FLAC MP3 to iOS for native playback. It's an app. And it's for OS X, uh, so if you're a Windows user, eh, this one isn't going to work for you. Uh, they say you can play any media in any format, connect your iOS device to your Mac, drag and drop the files, open videos or music on iOS and play. Uh, unfortunately, she says, I don't know the guy's name or even which of your shows he listens to, but hopefully it's DTNS. Thank you, Sarah, for sending that along. I think a lot of people uh, might want to check this out. Walter at softorino.com slash Walter. W-A-L-T-O. This is amazing. I have been looking for a, a really easy and fun solution uh, for this, although I don't know. I mean, who knows how fun it is? But uh, like, I need to get rid of a lot of DVDs, and there's a lot of stuff that you can't buy. Like, There's a bunch of old Mel Brooks movies that yeah, you can't buy 12 chairs or silent movie. Like, It's just not available to buy, and it's not streaming anywhere. Come so on, industry. Buy- I had to buy the box set, and it's it's just a pain in the butt to, you know, you download it on Handbrake, and, you know, you try to figure it out, and then you, it's just always a, a pain. I have the same problem with Alien Studios comedies, uh, Whiskey Galore, only available on DVD. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much to Sarah in sunny Seattle. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. A few messages from folks sent to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Alan uh, thinks Scott's idea of using VR for exploration makes sense, especially when you consider Google working with Viewmaster, as well as expeditions for schools. Alan says, most of Scott's examples were exploration as a person, but VR could also change the scale so you could explore inside a human body or even a cell, which would be fascinating. Or conversely, you could navigate the universe between galaxies, and if you could smoothly scale between the two extremes, that could be even better. Uh, uh, you know, this is, isn't this like the curse of VR? Like, no matter at what stage we're in, we always have more good ideas for VR than we have the capacity to do them in a way that satisfies our imagination. Like, it, is, it has been the technology for which we have, immediately upon seeing it, thought, oh, here's a galaxy of ideas. And yet, all we, we, it's an ever-widening pinhole like that we can see, you know, and, and, and you know, make this a reality. All but. Right. I understand. Sure. Somebody swallows a camera and you virtually reality get to follow the camera through their bloodstream. They, that, the, the novelty wears off. But what if it's celebrities? Celebrity GI tracks? You could go <laughs> celebrity GI or, or circulatory system, uh, possibly. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, just spitballing here. Oh. T- to T2, who uh, does a fantastic job running our chat room, go support him, patreon.com slash T2T2. Uh, I wanted to c- clarify, as a resident of Estonia, uh, about the European court decision on human rights yesterday we talked about that didn't allow for any safe harbor. Uh, he said, most importantly, the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights is only whether or not the rulings by the Estonian court followed European laws, or to more to the point, only applies to Estonia not to the rest of Europe. So that is a big caveat to that. They didn't just change the law for all of Europe. Now, it could be viewed as a guiding principle or a precedent, but it only is ruling on was this legal or illegal in Estonia. He said, we have to consider Estonian laws. Everyone has the right to freely disseminate ideas there. According to the courts, the local equivalent of safe harbor laws, specifically in this case, restricted liability upon provision of information storage service didn't apply. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday uh, because the portal owner was not deemed to be a hosting provider. Uh, And he said, lastly, there's also the local element. Estonian internet comments are 100 times worse than what you can consider the worst of YouTube comments no exaggeration. It was so bad that, as noted by the Human Rights Court's press release, in September 2005, the Estonian Minister of Justice had to respond to public criticism and concern about incessant taunting on public websites in Estonia. So this wasn't just a few nasty comments. It sounds like it was much worse than maybe you were imagining. Also, the 20 comments are documented and translated at 
uh, hudoc.echr.coe.int. We'll have a full link in the show notes. And lastly, T2T2 says to repeat, this does not say anything about the laws of other countries, does not create an obligation for other countries to enact similar laws, and does in particular not create any obligations for website owners. So there you go. Thanks for the clarifications, man. That's awesome. T2T2 is a living God. He really is. Uh, and then on Amazon's comment that as soon as commercial drone use is allowed, they would start delivering packages by drones, Proto732 had the idea that maybe as a driver enters a dense delivery neighborhood, he could send off a couple drones to deliver smaller packages that would meet back up with him after two or three of his own deliveries. The truck could serve as a short-range communication beacon. And Ron said, what about purchasing a Bluetooth-powered box that clips onto your garage door opener? The drone can open the garage, place the package inside, close the door, and return to meet up with the self-driving UPS truck for a recharge before its next delivery. I mean, seems yeah. legit. <laughs> yeah, totally legit. Uh, good ideas. I don't think I'm going to give any drone the uh, code to my garage door opener. Uh, those are Garage door openers are way insecure enough as it is. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter in that case. But maybe a beacon in the backyard that says, hey, deliver it over here so it's out of sight. I don't know. That could be a cool idea. Maybe I like a little, uh, a little like a, a lowering trap. You know, I could just like drop it into a little, uh, a little thing, and you could wheel it down like a, like like a flagpole or something. You know, you're joking, but they do have uh, uh, mailboxes specifically for things like UPS. Uh, they could come up with something that that like the drone could trigger and open it. I mean, it, it, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really kidding. I mean, I, I do think that if we if all we need to do is buy a little bit of special equipment like we buy a little bit of special equipment for a lot of different things uh you know mail and delivery and stuff is certainly one of them yeah no i'm in all right thank you justin robert young twitter.com slash justin r young go follow it right now he drops pearls of wisdom more often than you can imagine and you don't want to miss a one of them uh you can find lots of his podcasts spread out across the universe what's the best way to go for that stuff uh, probably the Twitter, but uh, you know, today I will uh, plug FSL. It's back in back in the habit. Yeah, like, like Sister Act Two. Uh, Tom and I do a uh, do a, 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 a here. Listen, I'm just gonna spell it out like this. Do you like fantasy, sci-fi, and other genre properties? I'm gonna take a wild guess and say you do. All right, that's it. If you like that, give FSL a try. Now, yeah. second level. Everybody already left that just likes that and doesn't like anything else, that's fine. So here's the second level. If you also have an affinity for not necessarily sports, but how bombastic and silly sports media can be and would like to see a love letter slash playful criticism of that media uh, using those sci-fi and fantasy franchises, then you will doubly like FSL Tonight. So go ahead and check it out. FSLtonight.com and Patreon.com slash FSL Tonight, where for the first time ever, you can get behind the scenes access, the likes of which we have never offered and may never offer again. <laughs> you know, we, this is definitely a test. Los Angeles Guardians of the Galaxy uh, at the course and Senators all off to a good start this season. Check it out. FSLtonight.com. Uh, thank you, our patrons. Uh, listen, folks, you rock, and you make this show possible. So thank you for doing that. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ace Detect, DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support are the places to go to support the show. Uh, but all I ask, really, uh, each and every day, is just tell one person about the show who you think might be interested. Uh, that'll, just, that'll just help us grow. It's a multi-level marketing scheme, sure, <laughs> but it doesn't cost you anything. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 Eastern, alphageekradio.com, player.alphageekradio.com. And visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back tomorrow with Darren Kitchen and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs> Done. That was a great show. What should we call it? 
I have some thoughts. In fact, the chat room has a, a devastatingly long list of titles today. They were on fire. I noticed yeah. that. It was just like bang s, bang s, bang s the whole the whole day long. <laughs> they were bang s. By the way, is the command you use to send a title in the chat room? That's not <laughs> um, by the way, I wonder. I wonder if if if, if Len is going to be able to even like hold his digital pencil tomorrow after the uh, after his disappointment. All I know is uh, my wife made a bet with him, and we have chocolate on the way. So, mm. um, all right. Well, how about Credo shot first? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it's an MVNO. I yeah. I had not heard of them, but yeah. Mm -hmm. The, uh, these are always and and like I, it's it's a, just a sign of how unprofessional and terrible I am that I don't read these better and I don't like I always just run into these names that like I I should just run over them and say them how I want so I can keep the flow of things but then I'm just terrified. It's that little angel on your shoulder that used to work at a newspaper and and he's saying Justin, pronouncers, pronouncer file. No, it's not even that. <laughs> I, I wish it were as noble as that. It's really just my fear that I'm going to say something embarrassing and, and everyone's just going to run me down on Twitter with pitchforks screaming fraud, fraud, fraud. I mean, I'm going to be driven through the, di the digital streets like Cersei with the nun behind me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It'll be Chad Johnson's Yay. body. So. Uh, the top ten ways you'll hate the new BuzzFeed app. Um but I, that seems a little negative, perhaps. Yeah, maybe we could spin that a little. I like the idea. Uh, top 10 things you won't believe about the news BuzzFeed app. Yeah, then there's top 10 things news outlets hate about BuzzFeed. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that's kind of a cheap shot. That's kind of below the belt when, like, literally all the news is about how they're not doing, like, that. And, they, and you know, they're... they're... And we, got, we made that clear. Sure. So why not use some clickbait to get people... <laughs> It all started with Clippy, I like. Uh, also, how about this, Tom? I didn't add new in there by myself. New is in the script. Oh, it is? Um, I, I, okay, that's, that's totally fair. I just want to do... Uh, really, it is? Uh, with the FCC's yeah. net neutrality new rules. New, no, net new is in the earlier part, you're right, but in the quote. I just wanted to make sure we didn't put words in their mouth. I wrote it wrong. You're absolutely right about that. Because I said new earlier. Yeah. I wrote new. Commissioner's new net neutrality rules. You're right. That's my inaccuracy. Uh, but their TVC quote... Gone, sorry. Sorry. TVC gone. I'm like the okay, I'm like the amiibo that keeps trying to do its job. Uh, <laughs> Revenge of the zombie robot dogs from TVC gone. Um, By the way, what a Pixar movie that is! Like the, I know the, the, the robot dog that's slowly dying. Like oh, good I mean, god! And and going on a race to find its inventor to find parts. I mean, it's well, and and the other ones need to die so it lives. Like I mean, oh. take my parts. Oh, this is why I did. I could have totally done the show with you, but I couldn't because I didn't want to cry on camera. Because this goes like straight to my soul. This is like classic Jenny Josephson had a hundred stuffed animals growing up. Like this is this is right <laughs> in the wheelhouse. When you guys were talking about and like items, non physical items that have souls, I was like, they're all still in my bedroom. Like I still have a, a select portion of them. So yeah, I get it. I get it. Um all right, wait, more more titles. More titles. Uh, by the way, if you want to get even more into uh, navel gazy pop philosophy about that kind of stuff, what does it say that I feel an intense personal attachment to my iOS devices, specifically my iPhones, yet I don't care that I get a new one every year because I ah. upload everything into a new version? Yeah, you know? you're just putting the old mind in a new body. Exactly, and I don't care about yeah. the device. The device goes off to Gazelle. Who cares? My friend still lives in his new house, which is, hmm. you know. if You know what? If only we could do that with each other. Should we do, but wait, there's more? Or should we do the top ten? Should we do the top ten or no? Should we just... Well, forget? there's always who F's the EFF, which I kind of really like. <laughs> uh, pepper is nothing to sneeze at. Hmm. Uh, hmm. One is the loneliest number that could be filled with technology. What's your favorite, Jenny? <laughs> oh, it's so hard. You don't, you don't um, have I, one. I like Credo Shot first, but I would 
I would, or it all started with Clippy. <laughs> what if it? What if it was? It was uh, one zero 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 one one is the loneliest number. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Let's see. Yeah, Tom, you got to make the call because I don't know. Or what's a what's a what's a uh, a popular binary like if it we just needed stock, you know ones and zeros to fill in. Well, that's the problem. Uh, a vast number of the people who get that joke will go, but binary for one is one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, could do uh, leading indicators. Zero, 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 one. Do eight, seven zeros and a one. Show it was, you're filling eight bits. Uh, I'm down with it. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a little bit of a cheap, but that's what we do here in Cardinal Nation. <laughs> hey, I can't talk. I, 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 I root for the Red Sox. I just stayed out of the whole baseball conversation because I was like, all I'm going to do is mention the Red Sox, and then people are just going to yell at me. Mm. So I'm just going to, yeah. <laughs> so. By the well, way, what it was I? What was I reading? That the Red Sox are terrible, and they shouldn't have given away John Lester, and they're falling into a terrible pit of no, morass. It's something that takes place in New York, and is being shot in Boston. Yeah, I know they oh, do. I, know. I just saw, but that it was thing like too. really iconic thing. I'm like, really, they're shooting that in Boston? It's um, it's a TV series. Yeah. I just saw the same thing and had the same Seinfeld. Thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> when you're walking on the common. No. Um, no, it's something where like the city is actually integral to the story. Yes, I, I know. I support. just saw the same thing in the feed and I can't remember what it was. Is it Law and Order or one of the No, no, it's new. NCIS. It's going to no, it's going to come to me. It was No, it's a um, genre type thing. It's a genre thing. Man, I can't remember what it is. All right, let me look it up cuz I saw right. it in Feedly. And I was like, really? You're shooting exactly, that in Boston? Exactly what you're talking about. Bang, bam, 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 bam. Binary solo, binary load lifters. Are more uh, something is, than your something. Of they're similar something. to your evaporators in most Thank ways. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't even think I got it. I don't think I nailed it. There's probably I was probably a few words off. But that's me doing what Justin was afraid of doing earlier, which is like, don't parade me through the streets about how I got the Star Wars quote. Shame! 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 <laughs> oh, man. Uh, hey, guys, you know, I, I, like, I'm like i going to break some news here. Oh, I've yeah? been watching that... Uh, that uh, you guys know there's a Daredevil show on Netflix? Whoa. <laughs> What's well hold on. Yeah. I know that I know though. that Netflix shows me great old movies. Yeah. No. It's not just for movies anymore. You know, they made this comic uh, called the the Daredevil and uh, huh. turns out now they made a show out of it. What? Boy, howdy. Is it a hell of a watch? You mean a, a TV show yeah. like Archie Bunker? Yeah, uh, yeah, those were the days, Tom. <laughs> That's um, amazing. No, man. I, so I'm like the latest, and I'm the worst. But uh, it turns out Daredevil is the best. So everything balances yeah. out because it's great. Uh, welcome. Good. It's great. Roger, you just finished it. Not I finished that long it last ago. weekend. Yeah, I loved it. It was great. Fantastic. Uh, might be the best Marvel villain of all time. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of the best. I think it's hands down the best Marvel adaptation into small screen or moisture or evaporators. Thank you. Ever Jesus. like consider even Avengers like com, 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 comparing and contrasting, Daredevil actually captures the feel of a series and not just a story arc. Here's what it is in terms of the villainy: is that. The best kind of villains, as we learned on The Wire, are people who think they're doing the right thing, right? The best yeah. kind of villains are people who think they are right. And so Daredevil 
owns that concept across all levels of heroes and villainy. It's a conflict between all different kinds of people who think they are all doing what's right for the city. Well, and that is the best. And, and it also avoids, because I think that is a trope for which we've seen a lot and is almost overdone in comic book movies now, is the villain believes that they, yeah. are, that they are really saving the world, right? But they're sociopaths, by and large. You know, yeah. it's, like, it's like, I believe that the, what we need to do is murder everybody and then we can rebuild the world. And it's like, no, okay, you're, you're, you're a serial killer. Uh, you're not really doing yeah. this. Pardon the interruption. It's go the new Ghostbusters. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. In Boston? Being shot in Boston. Even you know it takes what? Place I wonder York. if the ghosts come out because of the big dig. No, it's set in New York, but being shot in Boston. Oh, yeah. I thought I thought you were saying it was like being set in Boston. No, that would saying, be... You were, you were saying the city was integral. Yeah. To the, to Which the, is odd because, like, why yeah. not shoot in Toronto or Pittsburgh or, well, or places because that are Toronto normally... Toronto and Pittsburgh now look like uh, mm. The WB and the CW. Yeah. So in like order Arrow. to get a really authentic city, it always is just like <laughs> follow follow the tax breaks. It, it, yeah. Massachusetts had good tax breaks this time around, and so that's where they went. And New York City is oversaturated with all types of vehicles, humans, buildings, and everything. So, but yeah, it's it's kind of stunning. It, it's kind of a surprise that Massachusetts you know, ponied up or something like that because they, they've not historically been a place where they've offered really lucrative tax stuff. Yeah, I think it's so, because um, it's been they wicked are... Hard. Yeah, it's been wicked hard lately uh, down in uh, Dorchester and, you know, they really need a break. But I guess ben they went Affleck to New York to shoot so and much. were told, get out of here. So. <laughs> yeah. you know, and to answer your question, Justin, I think what really makes... Or, or your comment about re really makes the kingpin awesome is there's a level of self doubt about what he's doing. He's always you always see he's not like he's not 100% filled with absolution. Pub his public face to to his cronies and to the yeah. to his colleagues is that way. But you you see him personally, he's always kind of like maybe I maybe I'm not. Well, so I mean, I, so I, I just got through his origin episode. You know the the episode yeah. that, that primarily focuses on him, and it's uh, like everybody involved. It's just like I just like I, I stood up in my hotel room and, and just applauded my laptop. It was like mm -hmm. it was so good, and, and 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 such a great use of their ability to be brutal. Like the 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 violence, um, emotional and otherwise, felt so real. Um, you know, and and gave you a sense of you know really. It's like with Wilson Fisk. They've done what nobody, and I'll be surprised if this gets uh, fixed in Batman vs. Superman, but they've never been able to do with Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and not to spoil where that episode ends, but the decision that Wilson Fisk makes at the end of that episode is always, to me, what has separated Lex Luthor from just random bad guy villain of the week, is he understands you need to be the you need to be the good guy in somebody's narrative beyond mm -hmm. your own. Uh, and, and you need to show the world that, like, you are really, really good, that you are a, a net positive, even if almost more so if you feel like you're going to need to get your hands dirty to get something done. Well, the, the thing with Lex Luthor is, just at least in the movies, the way they've always portrayed him, uh, because a, a lot of those aspects of Wilson Fist eventually did, what, like, are actually in prison in Lex Luthor in the comics, but not in the movies. Yeah. The thing about the movies is they've always used Lex Luthor as a way to kind of define Superman slash Clark Kent. In other words, he's, he's almost like a force of nature. He's not, he's there to define the character and not necessarily be defined. His own character. Yeah. Which I think is, is such a disservice. And, and it is, you know, and, and we'll see what the Fantastic Four movie turns out to be. But Probably like, the, the the two villains that I think are always repeatedly bungled and botched are Lex Luthor and Doctor Doom, because they are they are fantastic. They're so good for different reasons, and uh, nobody in in any big ticket adaptation seems to understand why they're so fascinating and interesting as characters. I think I think I think outside of um the Joker from the Dark is the Dark Knight Rises. 
Dark Knight. No, it's Dark Knight. Oh, Dark Knight. <laughs> uh, like, there's, there's very few because, you know, there's a there's an attitude that you need to keep things, and, you know, for cynical reasons, you need to keep things very two-dimensional. Um, you know, for one thing, it's because they're easier to translate, right, into foreign markets. Because everyone understands who the hero is and who the bad guy is, and you can sell something number of tickets outside of non-English speaking areas because you know it's a movie. It's a, the plot tra- translates well. If you try to do more sophisticated, more nuanced stuff, sometimes a lot of that stuff gets, I think, lost. Um, I mean, of, but I'm not I, I would say like or good. Doc- I mean, Doctor Doom seems like more of a prescient character overseas. Than he does in America, like the 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 foreign power, who uh, you know sets up his own dictatorship, uh, you know is is something that. I- Hello. Oops, sorry. It just all like. Crashed on me. Yeah, Did it crashed, crashed on you guys. On yeah. Uh oh. I guess Tom crashed out. Yeah. Server error. Good thing that happened after the show. <laughs> That's it. That's it. No. That's <laughs> it. Google doesn't want us to talk about this anymore. Apparently. Google's run by Doctor Doom. Apparently. Apparently. Oh, look at that. I still want to do. I Tom. I still want to pitch that Star Trek show we were talking about. An idea. Where we would do, do we would do a Star Trek show, but not based around either the Federation or Starfleet. It would oh, the off, 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 screen yes. Star Trek. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Uh, well, we're gonna get out of here uh, before the. Apparently, uh, Google wants us to get out of here <laughs> before the server dumps again. Because I don't know what this does to the final video anyway. Uh, stay tuned for Tell It Anyway with its sudden but inevitable betrayal, celebrating episode 15.